Hey everyone! Today I want to talk about one of the strangest animals to ever exist. It's called the Spinosaurus, a semi-aquatic dinosaur from the late Cretaceous period. Oh boy, already starting the video off with a controversy. So far, I've avoided talking about dinosaurs on this channel because, well, people like them. There's a lot of experts out there. Everything I say in this video will probably be outdated within a year. Some of it's probably already outdated, given how hot a topic Spinosaurus is right now. You heard that right. The dinosaur community has hot topics. For the Spinosaurus, there's currently a debate about whether or not they live primarily in water like a crocodile, or if it was more like a pelican, surviving along coastlines and sticking its head in the water to feed on fish. These are the current questions paleontologists are asking about this creature. But that's sort of the history with this animal. It's an enigma. Because let's face it, this animal is weird. I mean, look at it. It has a crocodile-like mouth, a large sail on its back, tiny duck-like legs, and the tail of an axolot. Oh, and we can't forget that small crown on the top of its head. This completes the ensemble. The Spinosaurus was massive, bigger than a T-Rex, but don't let that fool you. Despite what you might see in the movies, Spinosaurus wasn't built to fight large theropods like T-Rex. This animal was designed for hunting fish, and the fact that it might have been aquatic was a revolutionary idea in the dinosaur community. Throughout the fossil record, we really don't see any fully aquatic dinosaurs. Hold on, what about these guys? Ah yes, let's see. That's a croc, that's a marine reptile, that one's a fish, and that's not even a real animal. Believe it or not, aquatic dinosaurs are extremely rare. Aside from relatives of Spinosaurus, who we'll talk about in a bit, the only semi-aquatic dinosaur I could find is, I swear, these names, Leoningosaurus. And even that one is up for debate as far as aquatic life goes. Also highly debated is the amount of time Spinosaurus actually spent in the water. The road to the current design for this animal is a captivating tale. And if you're like me, you probably remember a time when the Spinosaurus looked a bit different. What happened? It used to have those dancer legs. This thing looks like it could barely stand. This can't be right. Did we give it the wrong legs or something? Well, yes, we did actually. But why would we change them? Why not just leave the legs how they were? Why do we have to ruin Jurassic Park 3? Actually, the script did that. The reason we changed the legs on Spinosaurus is simple. We found its real legs. These babies never belong to Spinosaurus. They belong to this guy, its cousin, Suchomimus. This is the reality of recreating dinosaurs. Most of what we see are not complete representations of their bones. Instead, what we have are amalgamations of incomplete skeletons. But that's just for the weird ones, right? Well, we should probably talk about museums. I'm sorry to break the illusion, but if you didn't know, most of the fossils you see in museums are actually replicas. Sometimes you can tell if the fossil is authentic by checking to see if it has extra braces on it. But more often than not, it's going to be a replica. If you have a T-Rex, there's a good chance it's BHI-3033, or as his mother calls him, Stan. The real Stan is in a private collection, but replicas of his fossilized skeleton can be found in museums all over the world. But so what if they're replicas? It still looks like a T-Rex. I trust them to do a good job. I do too. But the reason this is important is that we tend to think of complete skeletons as being more common than they actually are. For the Tyrannosaurus rex, there's only 7 specimens that are more than 50% complete. Our friend Stan is number 6 on that list, coming in at an impressive 65% completion. Thankfully for the T-Rex, we have enough similar pieces to assemble an accurate puzzle. But that's not always the case. Sometimes, we have to make assumptions about what these animals look like. Enter the Spinosaurus. It's the early 1900s, and a German paleontologist by the name of Ernest Stromer is exploring the sands of Egypt. You can tell it's Egypt because I put a pyramid in the background. Stromer was looking for mammals, not dinosaurs. He wanted to prove his theory of human origins being in Africa, but his journey took an unexpected turn when he discovered a large extinct predatory animal buried in the Baharia Formation. Um, what's that? The Baharia Formation is a geological formation, a layer of rock with consistent characteristics such as plants and animals that occupies a particular boundary. Basically, it's that icing layer in a birthday cake. That's where we find the Spinosaurus. Thankfully, Stromer knew the types of fossils he was finding were rare, and in 1911, he returned to Germany to describe his findings. One of the animals he had found had a large slender jaw with elongated teeth, but its most extraordinary feature was its vertebrae. The vertebrae extended out 1.7 meters, or about 5.5 feet, forming a large sail along its back. He named the creature Spinosaurus aegypticus, and the fossils were put on display at the Paleontology Museum in Munich. Finally, we can start the process of recreating this creature. Now remember, this was a time when dinosaurs were depicted dragging their tails and boxing giant gorillas, so the early depictions of Spinosaurus were a bit dipsy, not to be confused with Dipsy the Diplodocus. Not to worry though, because the dinosaur renaissance is just around the- wait, what do you mean it's gone? What on earth was going on in Germany in 1944 that could lead to- oh, right. Unfortunately, during World War II, the fossils were destroyed in an air raid. With the original fossils lost, so too was the interest in Spinosaurus. Throughout the decades, as our view of dinosaurs transitioned from slow tail-dragging reptiles to being fast and warm-blooded, 
the Spinosaurus also received a makeover. Okay, so how do we go about this? Let's start by taking a look at what we have. Teeth? That's good. Bits of tail? Alright. Is this just the photograph of the original fossils found in 1912? Wait, that's all we have? Do paleontologists just make this stuff up? How do they even know what the rest of the animal even looked like? By looking at similar animals with more complete skeletons. Oh. Carry on. If we take a look at the fossils we do have for Spinosaurus, the first thing we see is that it has a crocodile-like snout. It turns out a few other dinosaurs also have this type of snout, and one of them lived nearby. This neighbor to Spinosaurus is called Suchomimus, and if we take a look at their jaws, the resemblance is uncanny. They're practically twins! But the similarities don't stop there. Suchomimus didn't have a sail like Spinosaurus, but you can see the similarities in their vertebrae. Thus, like putting a puzzle together, we can create a chimera for the creature that represents what we think the creature probably looked like based on similar species. Remember, we do this for all creatures, and it tends to have a good track record. So this version of Spinosaurus is the one that would stick with us for the next several decades. During that time, we discovered a few more teeth and lower jawbones, including the discovery of a possible secondary species of Spinosaurus in Morocco. Then, in 2014, archaeologist Nazir Ibrahim set out to finally fill in the gaps of the Spinosaurus skeleton. Working with local fossil hunters in the area, Ibrahim and his colleagues discovered a sub-adult Spinosaurus with... <gasps> LEGS! TINY LITTLE LEGS! What the? How does that make any sense? This thing looks like it could barely stand. How is that even a predator? To better understand this bizarre creature, we first need to understand the world it lived in. Spinosaurus faced several challenges. The region of northern Africa was full of a multitude of predators. Predators such as Cardontosaurus, a large theropod with a massive skull and sharp serrated teeth. The bite from this animal was so powerful, it likely had a hunting advantage that would force the other large predators to explore different ecological niches. Our friend Suchomimus also fell into this category. So that's the competition. But plenty for everyone, right? You can't support a large population of predators without a massive food source. How do the herbivores stack up? Do we have a large population of titanosaurs? Or maybe herds of apatosaur-like sauropods for predators to prey upon? What have we got? Well, we have Egyptosaurus at a whopping 7 tons, as well as Rebeccasaurus coming in at 8 tons. Right. Now, can you remind me how big the predators were? That's it? I don't understand. If we have so many large predators with so huge large herbivores for food, how did they compete? They didn't. In order to coexist among such strong competition, the Spinosaurus avoided direct contact with its rivals. It did so by developing an ecological niche. How did it do this? By saying toodaloo to the land and switching to an all-fish diet. Okay, mostly fish. He also ate turtles. This allowed the Spinosaurus to adapt its hunting strategy and utilize different habitats such as coastal areas and riverbanks. We know this by the preserved fish remains found in the fossilized stomach region of Spinosaurus remains. The current idea is that the Spinosaurus was a stealth predator like a penguin. Wait, that's not right. A stealth predator like a pelican or a heron, moving along the water's edge and using its flexible neck to ambush prey from the surface. Okay, so now we have to talk about the thing. Was Spinosaurus semi or fully aquatic? Just like its body, this question has evolved over time. In 2020, our friend Ibrahim published a paper on a newly discovered tail for Spinosaurus. The tail was long and flat like the tail of an axolot, and when combined with its back legs, could be used to propel the Spinosaurus through the water. This was a big deal, because for the first time, we were looking at Spinosaurus as a fully aquatic dinosaur, rapidly chasing down its prey below the water. But there are some issues. For starters, Ibrahim points out that the tail wasn't very muscular, meaning it likely didn't have the strength it needed to propel itself through the water. It also doesn't help that it has a massive sail on its back, creating drag. In order to avoid too much drag, the Spinosaurus would have to dive below the waterline, and according to a recent paper by Hone and Holtz, the Spinosaurus would have had to plunge 6 meters below the water. Now, you might think, so what? Just go a little bit deeper. Well, there are a few problems with this. In 2022, Paul Sereno and his team created a 3D model of the muscular structure around Spinosaurus. The purpose was to figure out what kind of propulsion system the animal would have to work with. What they discovered was that because of all the drag caused by the spine, the amount of power the tail could generate wasn't enough to push against the drag, and the Spinosaurus likely couldn't dive below the water. Imagine yourself trying to dive with a giant surfboard in your hand. Unless you have some extra assistance, you won't make it very far below the water. But there's another issue with buoyancy. As you can imagine, the Spinosaurus was a bit top-heavy. Its large spine would have caused a lot of rolling in the water, and its muscle structure really wasn't designed to combat that either. Finally, we have the skull. The nostrils of Spinosaurus rest at the top of its head, and you would think that this would allow them to be like a crocodile, using their nostrils as a periscope to take in air, while their body hides below the water. But take a closer look. 
The nostrils on a crocodile are located at the tip of its nose and pointed up, whereas the nostrils on the Spinosaurus are situated halfway down its skull, and they're kind of just poking out. They're not really on top like they're on a croc, meaning Spinosaurus really couldn't do this. In order to come up for air, it would have had to have looked like this, which would have been a bold hunting strategy. But if the Spinosaurus were more like a coastal bird such as a heron, this type of nostril would have been perfect. The Spinosaurus could stick its head in the water with its nostrils above the waterline, and it could prey on fish passing by. In addition to the position of the nostrils, the long neck of Spinosaurus also supports this idea, as it allows coastal birds to snap at their prey, ambushing them from above. As you probably noticed, a lot of this stuff is very recent, so stay tuned on this topic as it's really hot in the paleontology community right now. But for now, what we have is a creature that looks like a six-ton stork. Its unique adaptations allowed it to blend elements of both aquatic and terrestrial lifestyles, making it a ferocious predator. As scientists continue to uncover new evidence, we grow closer to understanding this ancient world. But Spinosaurus isn't the only dinosaur that's had its appearance altered by Hollywood. Another one of my favorite dinosaurs is the Dilophosaurus. Dilophosaurus made its debut in the film Jurassic Park. Um, it started as a book napkin. Aw oh, man, I have to read! Many of you are probably familiar with some of the liberties the film and book took with this animal, adding the ability to spit venom and giving it that awesome frill. However, that's not the only artistic liberty this animal has received. It might surprise you to know that- Wait, already? Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time, so I guess we'll have to cover the Dilophosaurus in another video. Until then, I want to thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video, I look forward to seeing you next time, and don't forget to bring snacks.